For, for those of you who haven't heard, we hired a new minister to um, Unity, at Unity Temple in the Plaza. Uh, Neon Doherty joins our ministerial team of Nima Taylor, Sandra Campbell, and myself. And please give her a warm welcome as she does her first talk ever at Unity Temple. So good morning, everybody. I am so honored to be here today to share in sacred space together with you, knowing that right here where we stand is indeed holy ground. And not just by virtue of the place that we inhabit physically, but the place that we inhabit in consciousness that right here, that the space that we build together, this entire congregation, the ministerial team, the musicians, <laughs> is holy ground. So, part of having Victor up here today, I thought would be a good way of explaining my last name. Because you know, while I might look to be Irish, <laughs> For the record, I am only really Irish by marriage. <coughs> and even then, only for the last three months, and in fact, today to the day is our three-month wedding anniversary. So, <laughs> happy anniversary, honey. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Pretty amazing. We got married out at Unity Village. And the other thing I want to share today, uh, with respect to Victor and me, is that Today's service, this white stone service, is a really special kind of service to me because Victor and I actually met at a white stone ceremony out at Unity Village exactly two years ago. So, it's a very special service because we met there. And I want to say something about this. The main point of sharing this fact is this. If you are single, and you are looking for a new name, today is your day. <laughs> but I also want to tell you that the name Doherty has been taken, so. <laughs> but, you know, there are a lot of other names out there. Whether you are single, whether you are married, whether you have that relationship status on Facebook called It's Complicated, whether you are young or older, whether you just feel young or are starting to feel a little bit older, whether you've had already in your lives many, many different names through the different marriages or the different job titles, the different uh, academic or professional credentials that you have held, the various nicknames that you might have been given. Whether you've had all these different names, if you are here today, and if you're really open and receptive, if you choose, you have the opportunity at today's White Stone service to claim for yourself, or perhaps in some cases, to reclaim a new name. Hmm. And by a new name, I don't really mean a last name. I don't really mean just like a, a job title or a nickname. What I mean is something so much deeper than that. What I'm talking about is your spiritual name. This is the kind of name that calls your very soul forward, that calls you deeper into the knowing of your own being, that calls you higher to a fuller expression of your Christ identity, of your Buddha nature, a greater fulfillment and knowing of that which is truly yours. So today, 
the name you get might be a new name when it comes to your egoic identity or to your human identity. But this is an old name, a name that is known already to your souls. So today's service actually has its roots in antiquity. It's based on a passage found in the Bible, in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, verse 17, which says essentially this, to you who conquers or overcomes, I will give you a white stone with a new name written on that stone, which no one knows except you who receives it. So now back in Jesus' day, in the time of the Roman Empire, after prisoners had served their time and they were being released, they were actually given this white stone to represent a clean slate or a fresh start. So in this way, these people were both literally and symbolically, through this gesture of this white stone, freed from their past identities and allowed to make a new name for themselves. So thanks to Christine Garvey on our staff here today, the white stones that you have that we're using today are these very special hand-cut Jerusalem stones that were quarried in Israel. So the stones that the welcome team has handed to you today are actually stones that have been carved out of an entire history of a people's overcoming. To you who overcomes, I will give you a white stone with a new name. So it has seemed to me that each of us is kind of like one of those prisoners to the extent that we have been falsely accused by others. And then having taken these accusations to be true for ourselves, we've condemned ourselves to living within barriers. Barriers that are not real, but that exists as if they were because we wholeheartedly believe in them. In fact, we lament about them to our friends and our family. And we've done this perhaps for so long that it becomes difficult for any of us to even imagine a world that is different from that. A world in which that particular limitation that I seem to have doesn't really exist. For many of us, these prison walls were built stone by stone when we were still young and vulnerable. Either we were young in age or perhaps just young in our spiritual development, and we didn't yet have the capacity to discern the true from the false. I know that this was certainly the case for me. For I would say perhaps two-thirds of my life, I felt limited, insignificant, like I didn't belong, not to my family, where I was the black sheep, not to my uh, community, because I was like one of the only Asian kids in the entire city, much less, you know, or the, the county, really. And so I didn't feel like I belonged to my family, I didn't feel like I belonged to my community, and therefore I didn't feel like I belonged at all to the world. I wasn't, I grew up in Southern California as a Vietnamese refugee. I was born in Vietnam in, in the 70s. I grew up in Southern California, and I remember I was never, I never felt like I was thin enough or blonde enough. I tried using that Sun In product, but uh, did you have you tried that? It just, just kind of turned it orange. Just. 
And so back then when I was a little girl, I was sometimes, not all the time, but I was sometimes called names like Chink or Jap. Usually it was by other school kids my age. And then, uh, and then when I got a little bit older, like in my early teens, and I gained some weight, uh, I was always kind of a chubby kid, and I gained some weight. And at that time, you know, young girls are totally preoccupied. Their self-worth is based on image or how they look. And at that time, I was called chubby and fat and thunder thighs. Those were the names that were given to me, uh, including by members of my own family. So for many of us, there, there are these names that have been given to us from others. Names like spoiled, poor, stupid, lazy. Names that do not testify to the truth of what we truly are children of the Most High, whole and perfect, made in the image and likeness of the divine with all power, all glory, all beauty, all love, and all wisdom infinitely available to each and every one of us in each moment of life. That, that is the truth that we teach here in unity. And yet still, still, we go to church and we do these lessons. And amidst all of that, we, we still carry sometimes, right, these names that have been given to us that don't belong to us in truth. We still carry these. We take them on. It's very important in this case to recognize from the unity perspective, these false testaments are not the product of an evil or of the devil, but rather merely of our own ignorance, individual and collective. And this body of ignorance which Charles Fillmore, co-founder of the Unity Movement, might say is part of what we call in Unity our race consciousness or our collective consciousness. This can become sometimes so thick with fear and madness and the weight of history that they stick in our throats and we find ourselves crying out, I can't breathe. But where there is yet still breath, there is hope. So let's take a breath now. This is a new moment, an opportunity to overcome our past. Certainly I, and I believe many here also, have this very strong desire to overcome these outer injustices and these outer oppressions. But I also believe that we will never overcome lack, limitation, and subjugation in the outer world until we have learned to release that limitation in our inner worlds, at the depths of our own being, in the prison that we built for ourselves. So unity teaches that we don't conquer by opposing what is false or erroneous, because what we resist persists. Rather, we prevail simply by standing on that bedrock of truth, 
In the face of the false names that we've been given and the names that we've mistakenly taken on, we can stand in our truth and reclaim that. We can do this here in church together as a community, but we also do it individually by claiming our true names, our spiritual names. And so that leads me to my final topic before I move us into the time in which we enter into meditation and open up to our true name. So what exactly am I talking about when I keep talking about these true names? What are they? Where are they? And how do I get me one? <laughs> right? A true name generally points to a quality of being like presence or authenticity, like love or wisdom or peace. It points toward one of these qualities of being that helps us come into a greater knowing that we are that, that we are that. Notably, a spiritually true name, which is what we're talking about here, is actually different from simply a factually true name. In this, a spiritually true name, from my perspective, must be universally applicable. And so here's an example of what I mean by that. So there's a fact out there that I'm a lawyer. Not only that, so I graduated from uh, Stanford Law School in 1998, and when this happened, my grandmother was so proud of me that she forgot my given name, which is Nian, and decides from now on she's going to call me the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so it could be a stranger, a friend of the family, whoever she was introducing me to. My older sister, Vun, was the doctor, and I was the lawyer. That became my new name. So, but you see, not everyone is a lawyer, thank goodness. <laughs> and that's why this is not a universal truth. But in contrast, there was a time when I claimed for my identity this truth, that I am love. So that was about 2006 when I started to do this. And something interesting began to happen. So, so I, you know, you claim your new name and you're in this prayer state about it. You don't know exactly what all the results would be. Well, I told you earlier that I struggled uh, in my early childhood uh, with weight issues. Well, this struggle actually continued well through like m my early 30s, and uh, and during that time. I, I struggled a lot with basically torturing my body through things like fad dieting and working out. I was like on the Stairmaster for two hours straight, these kinds of things that I did to myself to try to lose weight. And yet during that time, my weight would go up and down and up and down depending on my self-worth at the time. And then when I started practicing this love thing, I found that within a year, somehow my weight started, started to stabilize. And then suddenly I wasn't dieting anymore, but I was actually thinner than I was. And more importantly, I was healthier than I was. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is the key, love. When I started to love myself, suddenly my actions toward my body started to express that truth, that spiritual name or identity that I held in my consciousness. It outpictured in my life. And the beauty of this name, love, is as I said before, it's universally applicable. That statement, I am love, applies to each and every person here in this room. I am 
Love is a spiritual name. A true name is not only universally applicable, but for me, it's this point at which I deepen my, con my connection with the entire universe. My spiritual name connects me with the entire universe. And actually, the title of my talk today, Our True Names, was inspired by a poem by the Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. That's how you pronounce it in Vietnamese. The, the poem was called, Call Me By My True Names. And it relates to what Thich Nhat Hanh calls our interbeing or interconnectedness. He writes, I am the frog swimming happily in the clear pond. And I am also the grass snake who approaching in silence feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks, and I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate, and I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. My joy is like spring. My pain is like a river of tears. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughs at once, so I can see that my joy and my pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open the door of compassion. So, what is your true name? It's important to recognize that this name is not given to you from the outside, not from me or from anyone else, but it's revealed to you in the silence of your own being, in prayer and in meditation. In the Unity Classic, Lessons in Truth, Emily Cady taught this that that which God would say to you and do through you is a great secret which no man on the face of the earth knows or will ever know except yourself as it is revealed to you by the spirit which is in you. Important point to note, I don't interpret this to mean that we must keep the word that we learn secret. In fact, I think this new name is meant to be expressed in all the ways we possibly can through our words, through our body, through our actions, through our own being. But I think the idea that is being spoken of here when they talk about secret is that this name is known only to us in that, let's say you and I both have the same name, love. The way that love is expressed only through you, only in the way that only you can share and be love. That's what's secret. That's what's only yours and no one else's. So, what is your true name? 
What name will you call now? And that will call you into a greater expression of your spiritual identity and freedom, your Christ nature, your Buddha nature. Here now, it's your turn. I'm going to invite Victor to prepare us for a time of meditation so that we can then open those prison doors in our consciousness. As he shares the song that he wrote called Be Still, I invite you to take your stone in your hand if you have it. Perhaps you might want to even hold the stone with an open hand representing your own openness and receptivity and just hold it in your lap like that. And as you take your stones in your hands, I'm going to invite Victor now to share some music with us to help take us into the depths of our own being. <laughs> 